the, in terms of the types of smell loss, there are really two ways of looking at the question. One is transport loss, that is, smells can't get in. And so we see that with nasal sinus disease. We see that particularly with nasal polyposis. But we also see changes in the neuroepithelium with even chronic rhinosinusitis. Some of the work done at Monell and other centers shows that the neuroepithelium is going to become more disjointed in patients with chronic rhinosinusitis. Moreover, the recovery from any injuries to the sense of smell is somewhat blunted in patients that have these types of difficulties as well. The other type of loss that we look at is sensory neural loss. And that, quite simply, is that the nerves don't work or the nerves can't transmit the information to the brain. And this occurs most commonly with upper respiratory or viral uh, infections. And some have suggested that that's actually a defense mechanism. Teleologically, perhaps, if a bad virus infects the nose, it can travel up the nerves and infect the brain. Rather than let that happen, the first order neurons die off and prevent that kind of travel up into the central nervous system. Closed head injuries, as Beverly mentioned, also can be a source of smell loss because those nerves are severed at the level of the cribriform plate. And then we do have quite a number of patients that come to see us where we really don't know what has caused their loss of sense of smell. The, so the question is when we're looking at conductive losses, that first type, the transport losses, how do odors actually get up to the neuroepithelium? What constitutes a normal airflow to that area? And, Actually, you would think that's sort of a simple thing, but the flow dynamics are actually very, very complex. And this is something that Dr. Zhao has studied here at Monal. Oh, yes, Ed. I think it's you know, widely uh, acknowledged in the field that there's a potential of blockage of flow that contributing to olfactory losses. There's even notion of you know, conductive olfactory losses, like you mentioned, and neurological olfactory losses, similar to what we define hearing, conductive and versus neurological uh, hearing loss. And, uh, um, but as Ed was mentioning that, as actually there's little physical examination available that you can really reliably, objectively differentiate uh, if there is a conductive olfactory losses. Uh, for example, uh, there's uh, Polypops, polyposis is often a very strong predictor of, of uh, olfactory impairment. Polyps, you know, is, is indication of severe obstruction, but also indication of uh, some very severe inflammation. So it can go both way. And there are studies that are looking um, into a standard rhinometric measurement, such as rhinomanometry and acute rhinometry to measure nasal resistance and airway cross-section areas. There's a lot of studies going on, and the correlation to olfactory uh, losses is actually poor or very inconsistent. So that's presenting a very strong clinical problem. And also, um, the surgery, uh, sinus surgery, uh, you guys have you know, expertise in it. Then remove the obstruction can often improve olfactory function but there are recent outcome studies showing that this improvement is sometimes variable and very un, uh, difficult to predict. So, so that's why we uh, enter uh, this field by uh, looking at how we can, through engineering approach, to modeling this uh, airflow and nasal airway. And, um, and you can see here is uh, you know, uh, uh, a series of uh, CT scan from the tip of the nose to the back. This is probably not, you know, intention for you, but for general audience to look at how complicated the nasal airway in the human is. And this model we uh, is showing here is actually based on uh, exactly the CT scan of indiv each individual, so it can capture whatever airway obstruction potentially in this subject. And this two nostril in the front and the uh, olfactory cleft is really uh, uh, in the a, in a top for uh, people that don't know that about, about that. So uh, let's look at what can we simulate the, uh, the transport of. So this is a releasing, this is a natural breathing condition. You're releasing some uh, older particles in the nostril and, you know, track. You know, uh, you're using computation model based on very individualized mo uh, uh, CT scan, you can see where it goes. And this is olfactory region, so some uh, eventually reach the olfactory region, but majority of them doesn't. So even in, in healthy cases, there's a very small percentage, roughly 15% 15, 15 of the airflow that actually gets to the um, olfactory region. 
And this is the um, trajectory. So if you link all the trajectory of these particles, you see this path line of the uh, flow field. Uh, so this is uh, on the left side of this subject, uh, which is uh, very convoluted. You have you know, swelling and then swelling up here in the olfactory region. And this is the, uh, the right side of the same subject. And you can see here is the flow is quite laminar. And, uh, and here is our fetal region. So the point I'm trying to make is that the airflow in the nose is quite sensitive to some of the regional changes. And we actually show that the reason this left side of this same subject has uh, a little bit swelling of flow and the vortex is due to a very narrow uh, obstruction uh, right here in the nasal valve region. And if, if you can see here, where's the point? Oops. Uh, if you artificially, we have tried artificially remove the obstruction, then the flow will become uh, as smooth as the right side. So this will be an indication that, you know, even though this obstruction is far away from the olfactory region, there could potentially be a ripple effect that causes flow pattern changes downstream. And we follow up with a, a more, uh, slightly more extensive clinical studies. We uh, look at uh, 29 uh, patients. Uh, we construct uh, for each one of them uh, individual nasal cavity model, and we can simulate the transport of odor to the olfactory epithelium. And this is showing that this is measured uh, carbon one of the odor detection thresholds, and this is prediction of the carbon detection thresholds based on simulation and uh, three other factors. So it's uh, made a good prediction of the of the uh, olfactory losses in these patients differential of, of flexure sensitivity in the patients. So uh, in summary, uh, our modeling study seem to confirm, the objective confirm that there is a conductive impact of, of flexure functions, and more so that we can use this computation model to better pinpoint if a, a blockage that's contributing to a patient of flexure losses. So we can, you can design a better surgical plan for a better surgical outcome. Uh, by the way, in, in the, uh, when I went Ming Wei, uh, I uh, is actually um, a team of uh, Monell and Jefferson scientists who are clinicians and uh, involved in study. Both Ed and Beverly are part of uh, this, uh, uh, this study. We, they are co both co-authors. And we are have planning, uh, we've been planning an uh, ongoing clinical study, and hopefully by some time uh, in the future we can uh, give you a more uh, examples, a more um, solid evidence how we can uh, better improve the conductive aspect of uh, of fracture function. Thank you, Ed. So, you know, it's, it's fascinating because we, at first, when we think of smell loss, we think really the nasal polyp patient. This is the patient where you have large polyps obstructing the olfactory cleft, and it's quite clear that they've lost function. But what we've shown through some of Kai's work and work done in other universities is that actually, because so little of the flow actually gets up to that area, reductions in that flow can really cause drops in the sense of the, uh, your sense of smell. The, we're talking here not only about smell identification, because that's one aspect of smell loss, but we're also talking about thresholds. So that is that some of us can detect odors at a much lower threshold than others.